Uh, now it's time for our G5 high five, our round robin here in week nine. I mentioned uh, I'm on UTEP minus one and a half, so that's my first play. I'll go to my second play. Colorado State, Boise State, under 43. Talk about a, a gross under. Here's the thing. Since Andy Avalos took over in the City of Trees, that's Boise's nickname, by the way, the under is cashed in 14 of his 19 games. That's 74% of the games he's coached at Boise has gone under the closing number. And Colorado State this year, they're an under better's dream. Uh, the under has paid out in all three of their Mountain West games. Boise's holding conference oppo- opponents to just 15 points per game. And as we know, we, we discussed this team last week in the game against Air Force and really throughout the season, Boise can't throw the ball worth a lick and Colorado State limits big plays through the air. They're ninth in explosiveness allowed through the air this season. So what does that mean? It means that Boise's going to lean on the run, running into a pretty soft Colorado State run defense. But all I need here is just long drives. I, I just need them to eat up clock. And honestly, the, the key just comes back to this Boise defense. Can they hold them under 14 points? I think they absolutely can because the metrics love the Boise defense. You know, the only thing that they give up a little bit is explosive plays through the air. They've given up one deep bomb of 40 yards or more in almost every game this year, which ranks them 68th nationally. But if they can tighten that up just a little bit, I just do not see the Rams stringing together eight, 10, nine play scoring drives against this Boise team. It's going to be cold. It's going to be, you know, clear weather conditions. I don't think you have any concerns about fumbles or, you know, rain or anything like that. So I'm going to go under 43 here. I think this is a game that's like 24-6, 24-7 Boise, really boring. And really, this is a Boise team that knows exactly how they want to win games. They did it last week, 33 points scored in total against the Air Force. I think it's more of the same here. So I'm going to go ahead and ride this Andy Avalos under train. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm going to go right into my pick. I was going to take a different game first, but I'm going to switch and go out of order because you were just teeing me right up. Let's take another gross under. Give me Nevada, San Jose State, under Whoa. 44 and a half. <laughs> the reasoning for this is pretty simple. Uh, Nevada's offense is horrific, and San Jose State, State's defense is awesome. I could just end right there, but Nevada's at, Nevada is averaging 4.2 yards per play. That's 128th in the country. They're bottom 15 in the league in passing, rushing. Obviously, Carson Strong moved on. Romeo Dubs is gone. Jay Nervell went to Colorado State, who you just mentioned, took the rest of the offense with him. They now suck, too. Uh, Nate Cox took over as quarterback. He has somehow managed to throw just two touchdown passes all season. That's, like, hard to do in college football. Uh, he got pulled last week for Shane Ellingworth, the Oklahoma State transfer, but he's been just as bad. I was looking on Twitter, like, Nevada fans were pissed that Cox got benched. And he's horrible. So what does that say about Illingworth? Nevada hasn't scored more than 20 points for in five straight weeks. They managed just 14 against Colorado State, 16 against Hawaii. Both those teams are horrible. They only managed 300 yards, total yards of offense twice this year. That's it. Well, the San Jose, San Jose State defense has been awesome. They're 20th in success rate. They're 35th at preventing explosiveness, 12th at finishing drives and they've been especially good against the run, which is the only way Nevada has scored all season. Nevada has allowed just, or San Jose state has allowed just one rushing score in the last four weeks. On the other side of the ball, we know if you've listened all season, I still don't trust Chevon Cordero. I don't think he's good. And I don't trust the San Jose state offense. They have the sixth highest passer rate in the country. They throw the ball constantly. Cordero is averaging 34 and a half, pass attempts per game yet he's only thrown seven touchdown passes he's completing 56 percent of his passes he continues to be wildly inaccurate which was his issue at hawaii he just cannot complete a pass more than seven yards down the field and this team's just 89th in success rate passing the ball they're 75th overall well the one nice thing you can say about nevada is very surprisingly i was like i had to look this up three different times because i'm still not convinced it's true so if someone else looks it up and i'm wrong that's not on me i've looked it up three different times Nevada's defense is 25th in the country in defending the bass. I good for them. And that's all San Jose state does is pass the ball. And I don't like Cordero. So if that's the one strength of them, I think there's a chance Nevada doesn't score here. And if they do, it'll likely be 10 at the most. So we just need to hope that San Jose state doesn't score 35 points. And this under should cash. I had to get out my little Geiger counter, my little Ghostbusters, uh, whatever the the spirit, the 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 Ghost Finder kind of thing with the the spiking on it. Because 
this is a quit factor game. Yeah. One to ten, where is Nevada on their quit factor? I would argue probably eight and a half, nine. They'd have to win out just to get to six and six. And they're running into the worst team possible, really, in terms of a matchup, maybe in the entire Mountain West in this particular game. So I think another slow start for them. I think it's very easy to see them pack it up offensively. They're, you know, shuffling between two quarterbacks. It just doesn't seem like they're good for double digits in this game. So I really like that. Speaking of quit factor, what do we think about Georgia State? It's time for them to pack it in this season because Old Dominion's catching four on the road. And really, this is just like an eye of the beholder situation. The good Monarchs beat Virginia Tech and Coastal Carolina. They crushed Coastal Carolina. The bad Monarchs lost at home to Georgia Southern and needed a huge second half comeback to beat Arkansas State. So which team are we getting here? I'll I'll put that on the shelf for a second. Georgia State hasn't been lights out at home. They lost by 17 to Coastal. They lost outright to Charlotte, and Club Lit is now shut down, boarded up. And they just got blown up by App State by 25 points. So I think they're in the same conversation as Nevada in terms of the quit factor. I think they're an 8 or 9 out of 10 here. On the other side, I'll go back to Old Dominion. I already liked their offense. You talked me into the Wolfpack you know, throughout this season, and what they've been able to do with Ali Jennings on the perimeter has been great. But it's really about Blake Watson. Since he's really taken off in the last three games, 447 rushing yards across his last three with five total touchdowns, he gives them the perfect balance to have the best unit on the field, which is their offense in this game. And also, the opposite of a quit factor, this is a must win for Old Dominion because their drive for bowl eligibility to get to six wins, they got to have this one because they got Marshall, James Madison, App State, and South Alabama on deck. They can't really be asking for more than two wins in that group. So they got to win this game. Um, you know, I'm probably going to sprinkle in the money line as well. The fact that they're catching four over that key, you know, number of a field goal. I think that's a gift. I'm going to go ODU here. I know that they couldn't get it done in their last game, but I think that changes against the Georgia state team. That's just been too Jekyll and Hyde throughout the whole season and have just not been all that intimidating at home. So what are your thoughts on the Panthers? I know it's a team that we were more bullish on in, in August, but honestly it hasn't materialized. Yeah. This is one where I, 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 I strongly thought about it, but I, I'm very aware and honest about my biases. And I was like, I'm starting to get worried. I'm like, am I just, do I just like Old Dominion every week because I just love them and they've come through for me or are they actually good? And same thing on the other side, Georgia State has been so disappointing. Again, I, I, they were probably my favorite win total coming into the year. They're over and it's just been a, just a terrible, terrible season for them. So I like it. I, I guess I thought about it. I just ended up backing off, but you know, I never turned down an opportunity to ride with the wolf pack. All right. So we got one more, I believe, to close out the G555 and we can. Yeah. And I have a feeling this is, this is teeing you up because you started, even before we started recording, Calibri started venting about something more specifically, someone. And he doesn't know, we don't talk about our picks beforehand, but I said, no, 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 you save it. I'll give you an opportunity to talk this up. My last bet, I'm going with probably the best, no, definitely the best game in the G5 this week. I'm taking UCF plus one. I kind of hinted I was going to do this last week. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I think the Knights are the best team in this conference. I still think they beat Cincinnati. Even after that tough, tough loss against East Carolina, it was just a bad showing the week before. I think it was clearly a look-ahead spot. Also, that was just vintage Gus Malzahn. That's what the Gus bus does. He loses to crap teams, and then he beats Alabama. Well, this is the G5 Alabama. Cincinnati... They're just not the team that they were last year. They're just not. A group of five team, you you can't have nine players drafted to the NFL and not miss a beat. It's just not possible in the group of five. Now, before I say anything bad about Cincinnati, I do want to say, Ivan Pace Jr. is awesome. <laughs> he transferred from Miami, Ohio. He, was, he led the MAC in tackles last year. This dude is a monster. He's averaging more than 10 tackles per game. He has 15 and a half tackles for loss this season. Eight sacks. Both lead the country. He's pro- He might be a first-round pick when all is said and done. This dude is so good. So I do want to say shout out to him. That being said, they, ju- they have not replaced Sauce Gardner and Kobe Bryant. They're just 80th in coverage this year. They're just barely above Nebraska in coverage ranking. The Bearcats give up. They give up a ton of explosive plays in the passing game. Sure, they've won six straight games after losing to Arkansas in the opener. But they beat Tulsa by 10. They beat South Florida by four. They beat SMU's backup quarterback by two. Like, 
are we really that impressed with them? They've really struggled to run the ball. Corey Kiner's been hurt. Ben Bryant's throwing over 30 times per game. I doubt that's what Luke Fickle wants. UCF is 11th in the country against the run, so they should continue to shut down this, this Cincinnati running game. And they're going to have to just make them one-dimensional. And while I do think Cincinnati will be able to move the ball passing because that has been the weakness against UCF, the Knights have the best red zone defense in the country. So even if Cincinnati can kind of dink and dunk down the field, when UCF tightens up in that red zone, it's you just can't score. And this Knights offense is 18th in the country in success rate. They're 15th in rushing, 25th in passing. They've done everything well. John Reese Pumley is averaging 328 yards passing over the last three games. He's really gotten that side of his game going. He's still their leading rusher. But Isaiah Bowser, RJ Harvey, Johnny Richardson, they've all been great. They're super balanced. They have three really good receivers, Javon Baker, Ryan O'Keefe, and Kobe Hudson. They just they have more weapons at this point, I think, than Cincinnati does. And this is one of those, you know, was it what's the saying, the immovable force against the unstop whatever? Cincinnati has won 17 straight conference games. But if you take out that weird COVID season, 2020, UCF has won 18 conference games at home in a row, not including 2020. So something's got to give here. Cincinnati is just one and two at the bounce house. And they won. Their win was by three points in that 2020 season with just 10,600 people in attendance. That's 24% of capacity. In the two normal seasons, UCF outscored them at home by a combined score of 62 to 16. This is the bounce house, baby. It is going to be jumping. And UCF's going to get the win. I love on your deep, rant. <laughs> I love the deep dive of the stadium capacity. I thought you were going to hit me with like, there was no nacho cheese at the concession stand. I mean, that's what fuels the bounce house. Yes. Everyone knows this. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I hate Luke Fickle. I, I, I just hate the, the guy's worst. guts. Um, you know, they finally break through the glass ceiling. A G5 team makes the playoff last year. He has an all timer G5 defense that actually keeps him in the game. And he calls the most conservative, sad sack game plan i've ever seen like take your shots like on the opposite end of the spectrum it's the you know um coach pete situation with boise in 2006 against oklahoma where it's like we're here we might as well you know pull out every trick that we have to try to win the football game cincinnati's like oh it's fine if we just lose by two touchdowns that's cool then you have this game against smu where no matter how it plays out he always finds a way to screw me over he all of a sudden decides to be aggressive late in the game, goes for it on a fourth and one at his own 40, gives a huge you know shot in the arm to SMU, who turns around and just runs it down their throat and scores the last two touchdowns of the game to have a backdoor cover. The only thing that you know saved me, because I, I was absolutely fuming in that game, was Levine, the running back for SMU, looks like a dead ringer for Tim Riggins out of <laughs> Friday Night Lights. He's got like the little restraint stricter you know bull ring thing just absolutely powering through linebackers to get in the end zone so that did make me smile a little bit but luke fickle is very close to getting sent to podcast prison for me because no matter how i seem to play the cincinnati team they just mess around and you know fail to cover numbers in aac play and i agree with just about everything you said on the ucf side where if they come to play and John Rice Plumley gets a hot start in this game. I could see them putting up a big numbers and potentially boat racing Cincinnati. But this is Gus Malzahn. So I think it's going to be a binary situation. Either that or they're going to come out flat and just not have the game plan to be able to pick apart this Cincinnati defense. I, If I had to choose, I'm on your side with UCF. I think the bounce house is going to be a zoo. That's why I, I almost feel better that they came out flat last week. Don't you? Yeah, like, it's almost yeah, like the vintage Gus letdown spot where he just like, mess around with crap teams or not that crap team because i was gonna talk about but like they, that them coming out flat last week almost gives me more confidence if that makes any sense